Hi everyone, uh, thank you so much for attending uh, to our talk on the role of open source management talent in ensuring software ecosystem sustainability. So before getting started, we are going to do a little uh, Jiko Sokai. Uh, so um, for those who doesn't know me, I'm Ana Jiménez, Ana Des. Uh, Project manager to the Linux Foundation Hatarai Teimas, I work at uh, Tudu Group Project Manager at the Linux Foundation. And with me, I have uh, Daniel Izquierdo. So, Daniel, would you like to do the presentation? Yeah. Not in Japanese, sorry, I don't speak Japanese. But uh, my name is Daniel. <clears throat> I'm uh, the CEO of Viterja. We do development analytics and consultancy on OSPOS and, and InnerSource. Um, I'm the president of the InnerSource Commons Foundation. Um, the board member of Chaos Project that stands for uh, Community Health Analytics for Open Source Software. It's a Linux Foundation project. We are developing software and having discussions on metrics to measure sustainability and maintainability of open source. And I'm part of the board of the um, Apereo Foundation, which is a open source software for a higher education. Thank you. Um, so I think that the best way to get us started with uh, ecosystem sustainability. Uh, it's about first talking about uh, soya beans. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I guess everyone likes here so soya beans. I mean, it's the, the core uh, product or the, the, the core ingredient of many uh, Japanese uh, cuisine and, 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 and uh, gastronomy, right? So with soya beans, you can do tofu, uh, you can do miso, you can do soy sauce, and many other things. So to produce tofu, you need a lot of soya beans and a lot of packages, right? And those packages are not serving just to create one tofu. It can serve to create different tofus that are served across different um, areas and companies and restaurants, right? And that tofu can serve also as an ingredient of delicious food served at restaurants that a customer will finally taste. So what happens when one of those soybeans uh, are, is, is, is gets um, uh, wrong or is, is not properly uh, developed and grown and can affect then the tofu that uh, was produced with that soybean and then that tofu that was in, uh, inside a whole uh, set of dishes of a restaurant gets uh, poisoned and then gets uh, a really bad time for the customer. So we thought that this idea was similar to what can happen when uh, dealing with open source across the software supply chain. So we can understand these open source components on the layer one as the soybeans, uh, the tofu that is more a more processed food, uh, of layer two of open source components. And then the, the meals uh, can be the organization's products. And those can, came, can be proprietary or open source. It doesn't matter. We are talking about software. Um, and finally, if that software gets corrupted or gets uh, malicious, um, um, malicious software or uh, some critical um, risk, it can affect the customer that is the one that is paying that organization. So you see a small portion of a bad soybean can cause great damage to a business, uh, a business product or a business service and the reputation of that business. Um, and then translating that into the software supply chain is, is basically that, right? So the customer, what the customer receive is a, a set of steps across the software supply chain. And the very first beginning is the upstream sources that right now comes from open source. 
And Daniel is going to also share a bit of why open source is so well now integrated and what is the impact of open source in the whole software supply chain. Yeah, these, these are public numbers, so nothing, nothing new on the table, but basically just to, uh, as a reminder, right, that uh, from a cybersecurity perspective, we may have certain impact in uh, the revenue, and this is, this is the estimated evolution in terms of uh, cybersecurity attacks and all of this. So it's kind of public numbers, but then you, you are aware of this. Then uh, Linux Foundation reports and in other places, they are basically they are stating that a certain 90%, more than 90% of the uh, new projects that are being built contains open source or are even open source. So that means that basically our soya beans coming from open source is, is, is all spread around the meals that we are consuming because that's basically what corporations are using. So basically open source is, is everywhere. And uh, what it says there basically is the 77% of all code in the total code base is, is open source. So these are numbers are depending on the report is very certain variability, but in general are super high numbers. So open source is critical for infrastructure and, and code nowadays. Um, um, we are using this cartoon, probably you know that, uh, which is, okay, we have this super uh, great thing that we built, but then suddenly we have one developer in Nebraska, right? Um, if you go one, we we don't know if this works in Japan, but we think that Kagoshima is a remote area in Japan. So we think this could be the same uh, joke that in, in Nebraska in the US. So you have that feeling of what Nebraska is. Yeah, exactly. It's kind of, we, we, were, we were looking for the, 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 the most remote island in Japan. So we said, this might be the place. Uh, maybe there are open source developers in Kagoshima, I don't know. Um, so then it, it's basically about having, having this discussion on how to identify that there is a problem here, whoever is, is doing it. The, the joke of Kagoshima or Nebraska is basically there is one small piece that basically could contaminate the final meal, the final product, right? Um, so the question here is how can we mitigate this risk? And then we enter into the classic theory of risk management. So if we think about risk management, it's basically about identifying evaluating and making a priority of this risk, basically how important this is for you. Um, and then basically how can you mitigate this? So how can you minimize, monitor, and control this impact? Because this will, this will have at the end of the journey an impact in branding, reputation, revenue, and all of this. So basically this small piece may affect the, your whole business. Um, so now we would like to open a discussion on uh, what if, from an open source perspective, we have stopped thinking of open source uh, from the purely perspective of risk, and then we start thinking about open source as a partnership. And a partnership means that both parties are growing. So if you think about big, big corporation, you have um, the discussion that uh, you want your partners basically to grow with you. Maybe you have people that are experts, partners that are experts in AI, or in open source, or in security. As your company is evolving, you want them to evolve with you. Open source is a similar case. What happens here is that corporations are typically just consuming the software, and that's all. There is no uh, a discussion from a partnership level on how can we grow each other. So let's imagine you work in a big corporation, I work in a small library, you are simply consuming the library, but then if we think from a partnership perspective is basically how, how I can help you from a subject matter expert perspective, from a talent perspective, talented person perspective, and then how you can help me to grow, to be more sustainable and maintainable. So this is about risk management. So what's needed, right? And if we start treating uh, these open source as partners, um, we also will need to understand who can manage risk inside the organization. So for that, um, we need to start thinking maybe about internal open source talent or internal open source experts capable to be this connection, this uh, touch point uh, between the organization and uh, these partners that are the open source projects and the open source maintainers, right? Um, so when addressing risk, uh, we can see two approaches. Is not one is better than another, it's depending, right, on, on your goals. But there is this quantitative approach that is more on leveraging uh, big data to provide 
early indicators and potential risks. For instance, as an organization, you need to know your s bombs. You need to know uh, all the layers that we were mentioning uh, after and the sorry um, before in the <laughs> uh, in in uh, in the software supply chain, right? Like uh, these open source components on layer one and layer two, and uh, how are they interconnected? Wh how what is the criticality? of those projects in my uh, software company software products. So all that relates on big data, and there is a lot of data analysis and data hygiene involved to get that data to, to, to make decisions or to let people understand and what to do next. And that there is this qualitative approach uh, that is more on the individual feedback, because not everything is about data. It's something that understanding the community because you are engaging with that community can better let you understand uh, how to better help, where to help, and what is needed from that open source community. And that is, that is not about the data, that is about uh, having experts knowing exactly what that community needs uh, because you are engaging constantly with them. Uh, but um, of course, this is not that easy because one size don't fit all. Uh, we were trying to find a Japanese version of one size does not fit all. I think it does not exist, but a similar concept uh, can be this, the Junin uh, Toiro, that, not, that there are very, a lot of colors, not every color are, are the same, so not every company are the same. So we, we hope people will easily understand with that. Because the risk management, the concept that we understand by risk management can vary just by industry or even by the company size, right? Um, and for instance, by side uh, is that, for instance, in large organization, when they need to manage its bombs, it's going to be as twice as more difficult than a, as a, a small organization because they are going to have not just uh, one um, open source components layer one, they need to look into more layers and thousands and thousands of, uh, of packages that relies on their software products. So the complexity and the way to approach uh, risk is going to be completely different. So who should manage risk? And here is where, again, emphasizing on the, the need of trying to find in the organization someone capable of open source, uh, uh, of managing open source and having these subject matter experts capable of uh, translating these two words, right? So it, when you have that person, um, when looking in this process of risk management, that person is gonna be, needs to think about four areas. The first one will be identify, so how can we identify risks? And for that, there are good open source tooling outside uh, to try to identify. Uh, one is uh, depth of depth to understand your dependencies. Uh, the other one, also, if you want to look it more into a community health analytics point of view, like is it my project well maintained? What is the best factor? metrics like the bus factor or the elephant factor also are, are good indicators to try to know, okay, how many developers are maintaining the 80% of the code my project is really relying on? Or how is the organizational diversity of this project? Is the project being governed by two organizations or is well spread across organization or is more uh, individual driven project or more a uh, company-driven project, even though it's open source and there are several companies contributing to code. So that will give you data, and with that data, with that, that insights, you can take decisions, right? But the first, the first starting point will be look at it, know what's going on, and identify what's going on. For that, you will be needing data. Uh, the second will be once you know and you have that data, assess. So how can we evaluate these open source risks? And uh, that will be taking a look into these 
first section on the upstream sources, the open source components, and uh, do a little bit of data hygiene. Um, and for that, um, there are many ways of approaching this. Uh, this was taken from one of the guides from the Open SSF Open Source of Open Source Security Foundation uh, that they were sharing like a, a set of best practices on um, on evaluating open source software. So they they mentioned first asking a few questions like, okay. Is can you avoid this project or can you use an existing dependency ex instead? And then asking, is it well maintained? Uh, or is there evidence that its developers are working to make it secure? So again, all these questions can be answered at the in the uh, identification at, uh, phase first. And once you have the data, you can answer those questions. Yes, no, mm, we are not sure. And for that, Finally, um, oh, there are also, again, good open source tools out there. I already mentioned about Chaos, but if those, for those who doesn't know, there is the OpenSSF scorecard that uh, takes, I think it's eight different vi variables related with the health, uh, the security health of a project. Like for instance, is it well maintained? Uh, does it have uh, uh, security best practice beds? They, they have like a set of variables that has binaries of yes and no. And then they provide you with a score. So a 10 is, yes, this is super healthy, and eight and, and one will be uh, critical security, um, um, cr critical security, please check, and so on. So Applying it also in the pipeline of your data analysis of risk management can be also helpful for the organization or for the developer trying to understand if I should be using this project, I should be contributing to have, have a, a sense on, on the health of, of that project too. Uh, and yeah, and, and the same applies for, for the last question too. So when you assess this maintenance and this health of the project, the, se the third step will be treat. It's not just about saying, oh, this project is bad, then I forget about that. It's more about, okay, with this information I have, these are the projects that I, we feel as an organization are needs, needs aid, needs help. How can we prioritize, prioritize this open source risk in the organization? And let our developers to contribute in an effective way to those projects. So, uh, of course, there are many, many ways of doing that, of approaching that. A lot of organizations, what they are doing is having these open source experts being inside an OSPO, an open source program office, and there are a lot of OSPOs that in real life, they are making action to help open source software sustainability and helping and making that the, the organization's developers to make impact on building software more secure and helping the health of this software supply chain. One example, and as I mentioned, there are many ways of approaching this, are the false fund movement that has been adopted by many organizations. Indeed, was, I think, the first one back 10 years ago that started that. They have a, a book created by O'Reilly uh, that they share their best practices and the processes on how they created the false movement. And it has been an, an inspiration for organizations like Bloomberg as well, that they developed their false fund, I think, two years ago, Spotify to um, Porsche uh, automotive company also uh, is not the first one, but they created the open source manifesto where they share in public, these are the projects we are contributing upstream because these are the projects that are critical to make our products better. And uh, they share them and uh, they have guides and processes for the develop, their developers to contribute their time into those projects because they are critical to their business and they serve as a critical factor to keep their organizations running. 
And also, this is not a, a company, this is a foundation, Sovereign Tech Fund in Germany, that they also release the fellowship for maintainers. That is kind of a false fund movement, uh, to also to uh, pay a, a program to pay maintainers of critical open source technologies. And this was also inspired by similar concept on the false funds. And uh, once you have this treat, of course, you need to come back again and review if that treatment was effective or if there is needs more um, aid or, or you're doing something wrong and needs a different direction. So of course, monitor and report will be the last one. And it's a circle because open source dynamics are evolving really quickly. So what worked a year ago may not work in the next year. And that's why we need this continuous cir circle of risk management process. And we need continuous open source experts able to take care of, of, of this process, right? So yeah, so that's the theory. <laughs> And <laughs> now Daniel is going to explain a, a practical use case that work and, and that was applied in a real organization. Yeah, thank you. Um, so this is, uh, this is a talk that was delivered last week or the previous one at EclipseCon. So this was a use case together with ING, um, which is a bank in in uh, based in the Netherlands or originally based in the Netherlands, but they are all across at least Europe to the best of my, my understanding. So the next slides were already presented there, but I think it's meaningful to bring them to, to, this, to this conversation. The information we are bringing here is anecdotal data for this general problem of the industry. And this is focused on, on Kubernetes. So you know, you know Kubernetes is a super mega used software, super popular, and this is basically used wherever. Um, we are using the concept of community smells. Um, a community smells is basically, probably you are aware of code smells. Code smells, there are uh, tools that are running um, static analysis on, on code, basically, and they are telling you there might be some bad smells here, here, and here for different reasons, whatever, memory leaks, etc. So there might be a chance that something wrong happens here. So we are using the same, we are bringing that analogy, and we are saying there might be community smells. From an academic uh, perspective, purely academic perspective, there are studies that are uh, saying that by using community predictors, those are better in terms of finding potential bad smells in code in the future. So we are using this community um, unexpected behaviors and community smells as a predictors in the future for potential issues in the community, like poorly maintained projects. We are uh, we divided this into these three categories. Basically, uh, if the community cannot handle the workload, uh, if the community does not address the work quickly in a certain way, performance we can say, and if the community lacks sufficient talent. So those are kind of the three main areas. These are. Um, uh, metrics that we agreed together uh, with ING, and this is all released. So this was produced by Viteria, but by released in, in Chaos. So all the knowledge and, and tooling is basically there in case you, uh, you are interested in, in repeating this. Um, so how this works, you would get a certain risk factor for all the dependencies. So if we go back to the soybean uh, Discussion. So then, then you have like you know this is used here and there. So then at the end you have certain compound um, uh, community smell we can say or risk factor from from that perspective. So okay, going into this, let's go into the thing. So this is a dashboard. There are you know usual visualizations here and there. So let's go into detail what we are what we are analyzing. First of all, we are just analyzing the Go dependencies of Kubernetes. So just a few of them. Okay. So we have like uh, the Go dependencies, which stands for 200 or 300 or so. And then we realized of the following. Applying the previous risk model with the indicators, we have 131 components that are super high risk. So basically, and, and specifically, the why this is happening is because, uh, because mainly of a community regeneration. So there is just a few developers developing that software. So that means that there are 131 dependencies just for the Go side of Kubernetes that is facing certain risk from the community perspective. Remember, this is a super well-known project. 
what happens with that corner library somewhere that is using, right? So basically, that's, uh, that, that's what we want to raise here. If we keep moving forward from, from, those, uh, from those projects, then this is kind of a matrix of risk, we can say this. These are different metrics. Uh, BMI is Backlog Management Index. This is a classic, let's say, metric on software maintenance, which is telling you how good is the project dealing with closing stuff versus new things coming to the project. So it's kind of a, a workload adequacy, we can say. Um, same with REI, Review Efficiency Index. So this is for tickets. This is for review activity. Um, so mainly performance, you can say. And then there are others that are basically time issues and pull request, or merge request, or whatever they are. And then finally, we have community oriented, which is the growth of active communities. The pony factor, which is how many of them, of those components or projects uh, are being run basically by one developer or one developer is doing most than 50% of the activity. That's what we call the pony factor. And then the retention rate, basically, how good is, you, is your community retaining this? So the, the point of all of this is that we were discussing at the very beginning, we have a soybean, we can taste this and again, okay, this is good, but we cannot do it at the level of 30,000. So if we think about the usual SBOM, um, Jim Stanley, he said this morning that there are 50, 50,000 components that are kind of usual. There is overlap across all organizations. And this is just the overlap, the intersection of you know, the usual ones. We are thinking here, and again, this is anecdotal data, we are thinking here just at the level of hundreds, but you need data, basically, to grow into the level of uh, thousands. And that's where we are, basically, trying to build, to build these things. Um, thank you. And then it's about drilling down. So if we, if we move forward, basically, with, with the, but this is more about the usability, we can say, then you can go into a specific library, whatever, and then you can see, okay, what are the different, the different factors here. Um, there is one thing that we, we, I have not mentioned, which is probably you need to have thresholds to decide this is low or this is medium or so. Uh, in this case, the thresholds are based on a, an internal cloud ecosystem uh, database that we, we've been producing just to have something we can compare with. So basically we said, okay, what if we aggregate all the whole cloud ecosystem, whatever that means, for a certain definition of this, thousands of projects, and then we try to have those very same metrics and try to bring the average or the median or some percentile. So basically, the thresholds to decide on low, uh, high, or, or so ever, it's based on, on those, those numbers. So moving forward, so basically, it's, it's about finding these, these numbers and, and having these per, uh, for each of the components. OK, let me rewind a bit. So now we are discussing about Kubernetes, super well-known project. We have discovered that we have 130 components that are at high risk, mainly from a community perspective, because there is, there is a poor um, attraction of newcomers and so on. What do we do? The typical and the usual, and that's something we'll discuss later, uh, process will be just discard that project, ignore them, because this is at risk. Don't use that. Our approach probably is, what if we have a conversation with them? What if we have a conversation with the project and ask them, what is what we need to make you sustainable? Because you are important for me. You are important from, for Kubernetes in this case. And Kubernetes is important for many, many companies out there. So it's about having that conversation. Um, yeah, you can move forward with this. That's OK. And then we, we, we enter into the final remarks. So. Yeah, I mean, you, you already mentioned the first mm -hmm. point, like uh, data is important to know what's going on. But once you, you know what's going on, you, you have the power to talk with the organization and say, this is critical, we need an action. And here is the, the, pop, the role of uh, these open source internal experts to talk with this organization and say, hey, I think we need this, that, and that. They, they know the strategy. And uh, having a conversation can be one way of proceeding. Maybe it's important to start knowing where can they serve to, to help the sustainability. And I don't know if you want to add anything else. Uh, yeah, from the, from the S1 perspective, there is, it's kind of a hot, hot topic. But sometimes SBOM is just another check, which is useful because you need to be compliant with certain things. And then you need to be compliant on licenses. And then probably you're aware of security. We are thinking probably about the next step, which is 
this discussion about sustainability and maintainability. So just by the, let's say, having an S-bomb is useless by itself unless you, it, the S-bomb has a purpose. So the S-bomb has the purpose of being able to measure how compliant you are in terms of licenses. But then we are thinking of using S-bombs, giving this another purpose, and it's we can have a maintainability and sustainability uh, prediction model on this. So then the purpose of the S-bomb might be as well to have that risk analysis at some point. And, and I think also the, as a comment to the last point, right, have a, a risk policy to manage med, this but help them grow. I think it's important because of open source dynamics are changing constantly. What work for an organization that is really uh, in the early stages of its open source engagement maturity model, it can evolve in the future as they get more advanced and more mature on in terms of open source engagement. And even across the business units, the maturity level can be changing completely. So I think um, these open source experts internal to the organization are also a great support arm to, to help uh, changing and updating those policies as the organization gets more mature in, in open source and open source integration with IT stack gets more and more integrated. Yeah, maybe, um, so perhaps the last remark on, on my side is, um, so we've been discussing about the SBOM, the supply chain, um, talent internally in corporations and companies, how important this is. Uh, we've mentioned some tools and processes out there that you can use as uh, chaos or the risk model or anything else you might be interested in. So it's basically a matter of now talking to the right people in the company just to make this happen at some point. Typically, security teams might be kind of the very first uh, place. Risk management might be another good place for this. Um, and this is it. So we enter into questions. Mm -hmm. So any questions or comments? Yep. Thank, you. Uh, thank you for your sessions. And uh, I have one, one question. So you introduced about the uh, open source expert. It is similar to the security engineers. So uh, what is the different uh, role or uh, there is something specific uh, capability, something? Um, so in practice, I, I know uh, the vehicle to make that happen in some organizations are putting like open source program offices. Open source program offices is not, it's just open source talent involved. So those will be those persons, those people that has expertise in contributing to open source projects that knows how open source communities works and how usually have uh, deep uh, relationships with foundations because they play a critical role in most of the open source projects, uh, in all the policies and processes involved outside the organization, but also has an understanding on the policies and processes inside the organization. So they connect and they are some sort of an ambassador or a linchpin. Um, and, and I, I mentioned open source problem office because it's where I'm most aware of, but the name doesn't really matter. It's more about people capable of managing open source talent and having open source talent, uh, investing in open source talent so this open source talent can manage open source operations happening inside the organization. That can happen in the security teams, in the engineering team, and in all the different business units and teams. And if we are not talking about companies and we are talking about other kinds of organizations similarly, but with other kinds of uh, departments or teams. Um, um, well, I, I will go first, sorry. Um, so maybe, maybe, maybe something that is not popular. We were discussing yesterday about this. Um, I think probably one of the reasons to, to the very existence of OSPO is to disappear as, as a business unit. So this means the following. So if the, OSPO, if, if the OSPO disappears at some point, that means that all the processes needed to deal with open source are fully integrated. 
basically in security teams, in risk management, in legal team, and so on and so forth. So what is the purpose of having two legal teams, one in OSPO, one in, in the corporation? What is the purpose of having two security teams? What is the purpose of having two uh, uh, human resources teams? So slowly, with time, basically, all these processes should be entered into, into those. So going to your question, my point would be probably uh, it should be a security person with plus plus vitamins coming from open source with a full understanding of what that is and specific tools in the company that are basically tools and processes to make uh, their job basically happen. So that, that's how I see this in, from this perspective. Um, I think we have this yeah. question first. Um, th thanks, thanks a lot for the presentation. It's really interesting stuff. It's, it's, uh, it's a lot of stuff that's kind of like educated common sense. It's like we all agree and know that we need to be thinking about this, but it's, it's really very valuable to get a reminder like this. Um, so I'm curious, uh, and maybe this is a little bit more from the perspective of like the open, the, the connection to Linux Foundation, but how much is this info that you're getting on kind of under-maintained projects and, and things that are posing the, the kind of systemic risk, how much is that fed back into a process that helps to dispatch developers to projects that need help, if at all? Because I, like, I, it's very useful to know what baskets to not put your eggs into with, with this risk, but there, there's kind of the other element of it, which is actually fixing the problem. If you, if you know that all these projects are under-maintained, do you use this information, or is this information used by someone, perhaps not yourselves, but someone else, in somewhere in the LF ecosystem to actually dispatch developers? Thank you for the question. Are you aware of internally at the Linux Foundation? Um, so from the chaos metrics, but it's, it's really basic data. Uh, we can get some, or, or at least what I do in open source projects in Linux Foundation, is get a, a, a some sense of, okay, how what is the retention rate of newcomers, and get these metrics, and with that, I get, oh, maybe this project is having a, a sustainability problem that we didn't have in the last two years, or this is one, one of my uh, use cases I had a, a few months ago. So uh, yes, I mean, we, we are aware, but every project manager, I think they have their own metrics and their own set of ways to measure risk, even within the Linux Foundation, because every project is different. So the kind of what is what does community health and what does risk management have mean to that project is going to be different for me or for my colleague that is managing another um, Linux Foundation project. Uh, so I don't know if that answer. Uh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so I just, I, I guess the follow-up question then is, as, as part of your role in the OSPO, do you seek to have the metrics from chaos be accepted universally amongst your colleagues? Yeah, so just for clarification, I don't work inside an OSPO. Um, I, I work as a project manager at the Linux Foundation for an open source project. Uh, okay, yeah, uh, and, and, and the question for, for my, my experience is no, like I have it more for my own. And I, of course, if I attend to a conference or I attend to a meeting, I try to advocate for what worked for me, but I don't have it as, it's not an, yeah, and it's not, as far as I know, and maybe I might be wrong, I don't have it as a standard. We, we have like LFX dashboard, but it's not a standard. It's like you can use it, or you can use another different tool, and that's fine, right? So, um, and this is what I know. Maybe I'm completely wrong. <laughs> so I, I assume the Linux Foundation is, so they are claiming there is critical infrastructure there, ta, 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 and they are defining that based on something. So either risk or usage or something. So I assume they have certain data to make those decisions. Uh, probably we need to ask the research team or so. I, I'm not aware of that. So yes. Yeah, exactly. Uh, last question because we have one minute. OK. Um, when we see this, we all feel like, oh, this is a nightmare, right? Because even Kubernetes, the, one of the most prominent open source software, is relying on modules that are not sustainable. But there are. <laughs> relying on them, and it's yeah. not a nightmare. Right. It works. So I have a sense of uh, kind of disbelief. All modules are not equal. 
some of the modules you mentioned may be trivial. And maybe Google, they perfectly know they can rewrite them in one day. So how do you correlate the risk, the identified risk, with actual cost? Because not all modules are, are log for g and uh, how do you deal with that? So in, in this case, what, what you have is basically on the left, we can say we are providing the data. But what we need on the right to have what that risk means for you as a corporation. So then it's not the same if the library is used as for end users, like I know in a bank, like having your position or making a transfer, or if this is something that is used internally. So that risk level, we can say, will depend on the impact, basically, because you're asking on impact or revenue impact. Uh, that will depend on, on where that library is. So it's basically you need to... So the good point about open source, and it's, it's not a nightmare, this is basically how the industry is. And it happens with proprietary vendors. They are small companies or medium-sized companies, and they can disappear. And you will not even have the source code. The point with open source is that you have the transparency and the ability to have the data, go to the publicly available data sources, gather the data, and then together with your risk, whatever you have management internally, then you can decide, OK, this is higher risk, this is lower risk, this is my potential uh, revenue impact or branding reputation or whatever. So did, did, I ask, did I answer more or less? Partially. You want to say something else? OK, I, we, are, we are done with the time. Uh, so thank you for time advising. Um, so this is all. Um, thank you all for your time, and hope you have a fruitful discussion.